church how are you good I'm back here in the cage they told me I had to get caged up today so we got a couple of announcements for you number one uh, the all church Thanksgiving dinner is Sunday November 20th at 4:30. sign ups are gonna be right outside in the foyer out here uh, so make sure you go and sign up for that next is operation Christmas child uh, make sure that you get your box um, did they move the boxes? They were in the foyer. They're in the old foyer. Okay, so over there by the kitchen. Make sure you go and pick one of those up. Uh, November 14th and through the 20th, that's the collection week. So make sure that you bring those in. They're labeled. Uh, so if you already have them filled out, filled up, you can drop them off in the appropriate area there for those. Uh, Thanksgiving basket and food drive. We're collecting Thanksgiving food items for food baskets. We're asking for donations. Oh, stuffing, gravy, cranberry sauce, sweet potatoes, yams, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These donations would be needed to be received by the 21st of November, okay? So make sure that if you bring those uh, by the 21st of November, so the 22nd, you can bring them, but that just means the staff's going to eat them for lunch, okay? Um, <clears throat> youth, you're going to be in here today. Carl's sick, so pray for him. Uh, look in front of you or behind you. If you're in the front row, there's a green card. Make sure you fill those out and put them in the offering plate as it goes by. Uh, if you would, stand with me. Let's pray, and we will welcome each other. God, thank you for the opportunity again just to be in your house. And As we go through today, I pray, Lord, that you will just be here in our midst and allow us to worship you freely. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.
Jackson in the building. You're up. <laughs> See you. Caps everybody this morning. Good morning. 
brothers and sisters. Um, please bear with me from some little scratchy, but I'm doing great. Uh, I've been asked, do I get nervous when I praise God in front of people? And that answer is clearly no, never. Um, I want God to know who I am, praising him in this world. So many things we've done in our lives that um, aren't pleasing, but I want to uh, be knowledgeable of what I do in life. Uh, God's been so great to us. Amen. We've lost people along the way, but you know what? That's life. But life through Christ, you live forever. Man, he's brought me a mighty long way, and I still got so far to go. We can't give up now, people. We see all the signs of the world of what's happening. And we have to be strong in this moment going forward. <sighs> been so great, God. So many people here that I love, each and every one of you all, cherish life for what God has given us. It's so precious. Nobody else gives us this but our Heavenly Father. Everybody pray with me, please. We come to you, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. You are all we have. We worship you here today. It's because you deserve to be praised. My God, you didn't have to sacrifice what you did for us, but you did. When I'm weak, Lord, you make me strong. When I'm in a crowd where people aren't praising you, Continue to give me the strength to be the one that stands and not be weak and not cower away for saying the words of Jesus and living that life. So many things that we've done, Lord, and you look down on us and you say, I still love you. I see you trying. I see you wanting to praise me. Stepping into places that the ground is shaky. Stepping into places where the devil is running around so rampant, but you give us the strength and the power to be able to stand, Lord. Allowing us as the body to worship you. We get to come into a beautiful place and say your name, Jesus Christ, the King of all kings. Lord, I don't want to forget. I ask that you bless the youth, Lord, they're being attacked so heavy and they don't know which way to go. That's why us parents and us loved ones, we've got to be in their life bringing them Jesus so they know because there ain't no excuse. We get to do all these other things in life and have so many freedoms. But we need to be worshiping you, Lord, on bending knee. Lord, Heavenly Father, so much evil going on in the world. Continue to spread the Holy Spirit. Christmas is every day. It's not no one time of day. Christ in this world, Christ in our life, it's an everyday thing that we got to walk, not just talk it. God been guilty of that, Lord, putting on that mask. Underneath, I'm broken. I'm hurting. That's why I'm coming to you, Lord, because you're the only one that can take these things from me. And whoever is suffering, Go to the cross and ask the Father because he loves us. He wants to hear from us. When he doesn't hear from us, it's just like one of our parents here on earth. You, you're worried. Don't forget about him. He loves you, and he loves every one of us. God is your sacrifice, your broken body and the blood, the birth, the death, the resurrection, the ascension. You've given it to us, and we got to tap in and hold on tight, God. We love you. And we praise you. Watch over us each and every day, Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, again, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we're just blessed to be able to have the luxuries and the freedoms and your love, what's most important. All that you've given us, Lord, please accept these offerings in your son's name, that it does your work across the world and in our communities and our states. We love you, God, and just we don't want to walk away from you. This is the moment of truth where we have to stand as Christ followers. Thank you for your sacrifice and what we give you, Lord. We ask you to bless it and give it back to us tenfold. In the name of Jesus, amen.
message, I pray that you'd be in the middle of it. I pray that you'd be the one that speaks. I pray that you uh, open our ears and our hearts to listen. It's in your holy and precious Son's name that we all pray. Good morning. It's good to see each of you out and certainly welcome those that uh, are with us online this morning. Uh, there's plenty of room for you to come on in. We'd love to have you. Uh, certainly a, a big congratulations to the Bourbon County Marching Band. Uh, I don't know if you've heard it yet. Uh, they were number one in the state in their category and uh, actually took number three last night nationally. And that's just, uh, it's impressive, I don't care who you are. And in a couple of weeks, I think most of you are aware, uh, I don't know about you, but I don't normally watch anymore the Macy's Day Parade, but this year, uh, you ought to watch it, because uh, our own Bourbon County High School Band will be marching in the Macy's Day Parade. They were supposed to be there a couple of years ago, but COVID, like, uh, like it nixed everything, also nixed that. So big congratulations. Also, uh, certainly a big thank you to... All those who threw their name in the ring and in the hat uh, to serve uh, our community in a number of capacities. Uh, a couple of them uh, are going to be magistrates, and, and a couple, you know, aren't going to, they didn't get the win, but uh, we certainly appreciate all those who were willing to serve uh, our community, and we, we appreciate all of you. And so, certainly pray for these that will be taking these offices. Uh, there was an announcement made that you got to talk about signing up for the dinner. That is signing up to bring potatoes or yams, or something else. Uh, uh, we need a couple people still to cook hams and to cook turkeys, and the hams and turkeys are provided. So it's not like you go buy a turkey at $1.18 a pound, like I did a couple weeks ago for ours. But uh, the sign-up's out here. Uh, please stop by, and, and please, uh, this is a great opportunity for us to invite friends and neighbors. It's a free meal, okay? Uh, maybe they don't come to church regularly. Uh, bring them. We're going to have a good time. Uh, you know, it's next Sunday afternoon. It's a great time for us to have time of fellowship. But we do need people to sign up to cook different things, and it's out in the lobby. So make sure you stop there on the way back. Uh, I think that's it. I think everything else was covered. Uh, when I first came to Bedford Acres, uh, as a matter of fact, it's, it's almost five years. Uh, actually, it's a little over five years if you count the, t the three months I was the interim minister. But at the end of December, I will have finished five years here. I can't believe you've put up with me that long. Uh, it's just amazing. Some of you can't believe they put up with me that long either, I'm sure. But when I first started, okay, five years ago, I was told uh, that we had a certain deacon that uh, was given to, once in a while, using bad words. Uh, he would cuss once in a while. And I thought, man, that's not good for one of our deacons to be doing this kind of stuff. And, uh, and so I said, I'll tell you what, I must try to find a way to spend time with him and, uh, and this particular deacon liked to fish. I love to fish. I said, hey, you know, we'll take my boat. We'll go out fishing. And so, you know, we're just having a good time fishing. And man, all of a sudden, 
I hook this bass. And I mean, honestly, guys, you know, I, several years ago, I was blessed to catch a 10-pound largemouth down in Florida, and no, I did not catch it on a shiner. If you catch a big bass in Florida, you have to qualify that. It was on an artificial bait. Great fish. Fish of a lifetime. Well, on this particular day, when I'm out there fishing with this certain deacon, you know, I, catch, I hook one that's even bigger. I mean, the biggest bass I have ever had in my life on my pole. And I get it right to the, the boat. He's got the net. We're about to get it. And he hits the fish, knocks the fish off the hook. And at that point, I leaned over to Sam Bologna. And I said, I think you've got something to say about now. <laughs> Normally, Sam's upstairs with you, so I had to use him today. I could have picked several of the deacons. <laughs> And all of you that know Sam know that uh, that would be the farthest thing from the truth for him to be using that kind of language. At least I haven't heard otherwise. William Shakespeare said in Romeo and Juliet, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 8, we see Paul's instructions uh, for someone referenced as a deacon. In verse Eight, it says, in the same way deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. If you've been in the Christian church for years or uh, maybe even new, maybe you not, may not know this, but one of, the, one of the things that we like to say in the Christian church is that we want to call Bible things by Bible names. And really, it doesn't matter whether it's a Christian church, a Baptist church, Methodist church, Catholic church. It's, it's probably a good thing to call Bible things by Bible names. And, and so this morning, we're going to look at something that is a Bible thing and see if we're really calling it by the right name. Particularly, we're going to talk about the word deacon or deacons. You may not know this, but the, the, the word deacon or deacons is only used five times in the entire Bible. And, and it can be the word deacon, deacons, or in even one place, it's called deaconess. In Romans 16, 1, uh, in the NIV, it says, I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a deacon. It's a woman called a deacon in the church of century. As a matter of fact, there's some passages that actually use the term deaconess. In our text this morning, in 2 Timothy, we see the word deacon or deacons three times. And in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, To all God's holy people in Christ, church Jesus, at Philippi, together with the overseers, which also would be known as elders, and deacons. Now, what is interesting is that this word, translated deacon, is not really a translation at all. It's not. It's what's called a transliteration. Now, that's not a word we use a whole lot of time, but, but you've certainly heard it and not known what it was, okay? Uh, what's the difference, you might ask, between a translation and a transliteration? Well, a translation gives you the meaning of a word in a different language from the original. Uh, I'll give you an example. If I said the word gracias, what does that mean? It means thank you, okay? In Spanish, Gracias. In English, it's thank you. Here's one of my favorite because it fits me nicely. How many knows what the word gordo means in Spanish? Anybody? Fat. Fits me just fine. So you can call me gordo. I know what you're talking about. If you call me fat, yes, I know what you're talking about. That's a translation. Okay, taking it from one language and translating it by meaning into another language. But what is a transliteration? A transliteration is not a translation. It simply is a different pronunciation to make it easier to say than the original language, but it's not a translation itself. A transliteration phrase that you could all be familiar with, and you might have even used, 
Have you ever used or heard the term bon appetit? Okay. What in the world does bon appetit mean? Okay. Bon appetit is a French, is a, is a French phrase. And, and if you're in France and you're, you're sitting down at a meal, the, 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 the server or the chef brings you your meal and they say bon appetit. In English, you have a big Thanksgiving dinner, someone carves the turkey, and then someone might say bon appetit. Okay. So literally, they're not translating the words. It's a French phrase that now we're using in English. Here's another one. Taco. Taco. What do they call a taco in, in, in Mexico? Taco. What do they call a burrito in Mexico? A burrito. What do they call an enchilada in Mexico? Yeah, an enchilada. Those are just not translations at all. And, and have you ever looked at a Mexican, or a, a, you go to a Mexican restaurant or a Chinese restaurant? Or any of these restaurants, and you see these words, and then thankfully, most Mexican restaurants, if it says enchilada, or it says taco, or it says tamale, or it says any of these words, there's a description next to it, what in the world that is. Or maybe you're just like me. You see somebody, a, a server bringing a big plate of something, and they walk by you, and you tell your server, I want one of those. <laughs> I don't know what it is, I couldn't pronounce it if I did, but I'll take one of those. Okay, those are transliterations. Okay? You, I, think, I think we can understand that. The Bible has dozens of transliterations. Words that basically in Greek, and he, more, more in Greek than Hebrew, but you have both of them. You do have some Hebrew ones. But the, if you looked at the original language, the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic, and then you look at your Bible, basically what they've done is what would be called anglicized, made it sound English, is what that word means. Here's one. How about the word apostolos? Any, any guesses on what we call that in English? Apostle. Oh, by the way, I want to get back to there. Do you know what bon appetit means? In French, it means good appetite. In English, if you say bon appetit, you're basically saying dig in. Okay, because it's not really translated. But what does the word apostolite? What, what apostolos in English would be what we would call what? Apostle. What in the world does that mean? Well, Dean, right there, it means apostle. No, it does not mean apostle. Apostle is not a translation. The word apostle literally means one sent with a message. Here's another one. Christos. Anybody recognize that one? Yeah, it's not, it, this ain't rocket science, folks. It means Christ. No, it doesn't mean Christ. It's transliterate Christ. What does Christ mean? Oh, that's just Jesus' last name. No. Jesus Christ, Jesus was his given name. In the Old Testament, it would have been Joshua. Jesus Christ is not his first and last name. You could argue that it's his first name. And Christ is a title. What, what, what does Christ mean? Nope. Anointed one. That was what the word Christos meant. How about this one? Baptizo. Baptism. What, what does it mean? I mean, some people think, well, I was baptized. I was, they, they sprinkled water on me. I was baptized. I was a little bitty baby, and they dipped some water on my head. It's called baptism. But what does the word baptizo mean? The word baptizo, the original Greek word, means to immerse, dunk, or dip. It was actually used in the dyeing industry, and so if you were gonna, if you had some material and you wanted it to be purple, for example, you would literally have to dunk it in this solution with dye. You know, you wouldn't just spray. I mean, you might sprinkle it if you want to do some tie dye kind of thing or something or some modern art kind of thing. But to truly dye something, you would have to dunk it. And the word baptizo, thats what that word meant. We didn't translate it; we just anglicized it. Here's the last one. Diakonos. Diakonos. What's, what, what, what's the transliteration there? What's the only word you can think of in the church that sounds like diakonos? 
And if you watch the trailer at the beginning, you probably saw it. Deacon. The word diakonos is transliterated as deacon. It's not translated. So when you see your Bible the five times it says deacon, deacons, or deaconess, you're not looking at a translation. You're looking at a transliteration. What's interesting, though, as we dig a little deeper into this word, the Greek word diakonos is used 29 times in the New Testament in five different forms. Now, I'm not going to get into to that, but if you've ever had a foreign language, you understand that there's different endings on words that mean certain things, uh, like gordo, for example, you know, would mean fat, but literally if I say gordo, I'm saying I am fat, because <laughs> that long O ending. Gorda would mean she's fat, <laughs> okay? I don't use that at my house, okay? But there's five different endings, if you will, on the word diakonos that would indicate you know, uh, different ways that word could be used. You've got the word diakonoi, the word diakonois, diakonon, diakonos, and diakonus. Okay, no, there's not a test on this later, okay? But in those 29 times, it is translated, not transliterated, it is translated 24 times and transliterated five times. 21 times, it is literally translated to mean serve, serves, or servant. Matter of fact, a couple of those times when it says servant, it's referring to Jesus himself. And Jesus is never called a deacon. He's called a servant. Three times, it is translated as minister. And five times, as we've talked about, it is transliterated as deacon Deacons or deaconess. So now you're scratching your heads. And then you went fishing a week. And by the way, you all did a tremendous job last week. Uh, Lane was gone. Charlie was not in the booth last week. I was gone. And I tell you what, we were coming back from Alabama Sunday morning listening. or I was listening to Facebook. on, on my John had it on his phone. was going through my radio. You all rocked. The team did a great job. And you all sounded great. You really did. So good job. Uh, and so... I said that because you're thinking, man, Dean, you went fishing, you came back as a Greek scholar. No, I did not come back as a Greek scholar, and uh, I didn't want you to think that. Probably none of you would have thought that anyway. <laughs> but you might be asking yourself, why the Greek study here? You know, I'm sure Tom LeHue did this quite a bit because he's a lot smarter than me. But why are we doing it? Simple. At the present time in our church, our church does not have anybody who is serving in the capacity dedicated as a deacon. You know, and several people have asked, how come we don't have any deacons? And at the same time, uh, even though our bylaws call for it, uh, and some people just want to know why. And that is a very, very good question. So we are going to spend this week and next week, and we're going to talk about what is a deacon, what does it mean scripturally, uh, what should we be having in place to fulfill what the Bible says. And again, if we're going to call Bible things by Bible names, uh, we need to address this. So, question. It's point two on your notes if you're, if you're following along. So, what is a deacon and what does a deacon do? Well, duh, a deacon deeks, right? A deacon deeks. What the heck does that mean? Well, we're going to find out. From a biblical perspective, and that is the perspective that we must consider above every other perspective, a deacon is a servant. A deacon is a servant. And if you dig a little bit deeper, and we're definitely digging in the ground I'm not used to digging in, okay? Uh, the root word for diakonos in, 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 in Greek is the word dioko. Again, you know, no question here. And dioko was not John Lennon's wife, okay? That's yoko. Dioko, which literally means to run on errands. What a picture of what a servant should be doing. A servant is doing things for someone else. Specifically, a servant is serving a master. Okay, well, wait a second, Dean. We're supposed to serve one another. Well, yeah, you are, but who are you serving for? If you have a need and I'm meeting that need, yes, I'm serving you, but why am I doing that? It's because I'm serving Jesus. The goal is to be the hands and feet, the voice, the heart of Jesus to other people. 
the word servant. That's that idea. But if the word can mean servant or minister or deacon, what do we do with that? And this is where it really gets kind of interesting because, you know, and a lot of you have been in churches for a long time. You've been in other churches. So you've probably seen some of these models. There are various models that you will see. What do you do when certain passages say servant, some passages say minister, some passages say deacon? And again, we're only dealing, make this perfectly clear, we're only dealing with the word diakonos. Because here's a tip, kids. While no other words are translated or transliterated deacon other than diakonos, there are other Greek words translated minister and several translated servant. So we're only zeroing in on the one that we've kind of cut down to deacon. Okay, so I want to make that clear. There are churches, and there's at least four models I can think of. There's probably more that I've seen or heard of in different churches. Some churches will separate the idea of servant, minister, and deacon into three categories. They have ministers on staff, deacons serving as board members, and then they have servant leaders, sometimes they're called ministry team leaders, over various ministries. Uh, Sometimes they might have trustees. (coughs) Anybody here from a Baptist church background? Okay, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know, in a Baptist church, you have ministers who probably fill the role of elders, But you also have deacons that make up the board that kind of do some elder stuff like ours would do, okay? And then you have trustees, uh, and that's more because if you're incorporated, you have to have certain people that are designated as official signees on certain things, okay? And then a lot of times they'll have ministry teams and stuff like that. So you have all three of those words represented. Some have deacons as volunteer ministry leaders. They are appointed by the elders for a specific area or responsibility. They are often called servant leaders or ministry team leaders. Okay? That is how we are functioning right now. Our church is functioning like that. We have nobody at this point designated as a deacon. Some have deacons as paid staff. They're often called ministers. And some, like our bylaws dictate have the paid staff, they would be ministers, they have deacons, they are selected by the elders and approved by the congregational vote, and then they have servant leaders or ministry team leaders, and they are selected by the elders to handle certain tasks. Now, just so that you understand what I'm talking about, uh, is Jill hurt here today? She's not. Okay, I'm going to pick on somebody else then. Uh, Don Schaefer. Would you stand up? Just, just for a second. I'm not going to have you talk. Uh, Linda Moore, would you stand up, please? Will Sutherland, would you stand up? And Cindy, feel free to trip him before he sits down, okay? Because he was mean to me earlier. Okay. These three and several more are actually ministry team leaders. None of them are deacons. None of them, to my knowledge, well, Will, you might have been a, were you ever a deacon here? Will, at one point, was probably elected as a deacon. You guys can sit down, okay? Don Schaefer heads up a ministry team. It's our finance team. In a few weeks, he's going to put out a budget for you all to vote on. He's behind that. He's got a a group of people that help him, that volunteer with him. They're the ones, when you give money, they count it. They're the ones who record it so that you'll get a statement at the end of the year. They're the ones who make sure that when we put out a budget, that the staff and and volunteers who have to spend money stay within their lane. They do a tremendous job, and it's a lot of work. But he's not called a deacon. Linda Moore, have you ever been called a deaconess? No, No, she has not been called a deaconess. How many years have you led the Golden Age ministry? 25. 25 plus years, Linda Moore has coordinated and led... A group of people, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we have dozens of people that come on a monthly basis. They do trips together. They bring in special people to sing, special people to seek, uh, to speak, and they do do so many wonderful things. She's truly a servant leader, but yet she's not called a deacon or deaconess. Will Sutherland, what do you do? Not a daggone thing. Did you notice our nice baptistry, how nice that looks? 
Yeah, Will Sutherland probably didn't lift a finger on that. Um, he actually did. But what Will is doing is he is overseeing a lot of hard-working, very talented volunteers that have special skills, and they tore out the old baptistry, put in the new baptistry. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you want to see something fantastic, go up behind the Hope Building, and you'll notice those two trailers that are up there. Yeah, they're now about that high off the ground. Because Will Sutherland coordinated with some other people that are kind of under his umbrella of leadership to take the wheels and everything out of theirs and set them down on some railroad ties. So now we don't have to, you know, get a ladder to climb up there and get junk out of it. Okay, that's just three of our minister teams. Did you notice anybody wearing a lanyard this morning when you came in? Yeah, some of our greeters, some of our first touch ministry. Yeah, there's a guy named Wayne Kearns, a little bit short guy, knows everybody in the world. Does anybody here not know Wayne Kearns? Anybody? Yeah. If, if, if you don't know him, he's not doing his job because he knows everybody. Yeah, he's the head of that ministry. He's not called a deacon. Okay? But yet, each of these ministries and several others, I just didn't want to, we may mention a couple more next week, but every one of those are functioning in the role of what the Greek word diakonos means. We may not call them deacons, but they're deking, because deacons deke, whatever that is, right? Now, again, let me say it again. All we're talking about is the word diakonos and how it's translated or transliterated. So if we're going to call biblical things by biblical names, let's do that. But if you look at a lot of churches, not just ours, and I think ours can, has in the past certainly been guilty of it, and I think could be if we're not careful, what you see a lot that it looks more like a government structure than what the New Testament structure calls for. Now, let's dig into this a little bit. You know, consider for a second the Catholic Church. And again, this is not a hammering on the Catholic Church. Okay, if you're from a Catholic background, you maybe you're still Catholic. This is not a criticism. This is just stating how this happened. If you look at the Catholic Church, you got to ask yourself: When did the Catholic Church get started? Now, you could argue somewhere between 300 and 600 A.D. In 300 A.D., you've got an emperor by the name of Constantine. And Constantine decided that this Christianity thing is a good thing. And so he says, all right, all of a sudden now Rome is going to be Christian. Literally took his armies and marched them through a river. And had them immerse themselves as they went through. Okay? They went in as wet Romans or dry Romans and came out as wet Romans. And then... You know, in the next few years, you wind up having the formation of what we would call today the Roman Catholic Church. Now, if you ever wondered where the Roman came from, it came from Rome. Okay? Now, what kind of government does the Roman Catholic Church have? Who's the head of the Roman Catholic Church? The Pope. Sometimes he's called the Pontiff. Okay, what did the Roman government have that's kind of like a Pope? Emperor. <laughs> okay? The Roman government also had something called a senate. Now, their senate originally was quite a bit like our senate. It kind of morphed into something else historically, but the Catholic Church doesn't have the senate. They have the house of cardinals. So if the pope decides to retire or dies, who picks the new pope? The cardinals. Okay? You also had precepts and some other things, and in the Catholic Church, you've got bishops and archbishops that they kind of take care of, you know, each bishop and each archbishop will have a certain number of parish priests that are under them. What I'm saying is, though, if you look at the government structure of the Catholic Church, it's very much like the government when they started. Okay, and we can look at that and say, man, that's crazy. Let's bring it forward about 12 centuries. Let's look at churches that we know a little bit more about. Again, how many of you are from Baptist background? Okay, I'm talking about you. How many of you are from a Christian church background? How many of you are in a Christian church right now? How many of you have no idea where you are right now? <laughs> so, now you can get in a big argument with some Baptists because they like to trace some Baptists. I don't think they're exactly right. They try to hate trace their heritage all the way back to John the Baptist. 
Well, there's a problem with that because, you see, John the Baptist died before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, so John the Baptist was an Old Testament prophet. If you're going to take your lineage back to John the Baptist, why stop there? Go back to Isaiah. <laughs> okay? But the Baptist church that all of you would be familiar with and the Christian church that you're all familiar with, where are the roots of that church or those churches? Does anybody know where the Christian church got started? Don't tell me you don't know because we're about eight miles from it. Cane Ridge, that's where the Christian church got started. And even back then, the Cane Ridge, it was in the United States. The Baptist church that all of you are familiar with, guess what? It kind of started in the United States too. What kind of government did they have when they started those two churches? Duh, we just had election day. <laughs> they had a U.S. government, okay? What does the U.S. government look like? It's got three branches, right? What are they? The judicial, the legislative, and the executive, right? So if you take the word diakonos and you come up with ministers and servants and deacons and then you look at a lot of churches that we call the Baptist church, you've got the pastor, you've got the deacons, and you've got the trustees. Oh, wait a second, let's dial that down just a little bit more. In the Christian church, what do we have? We have a pastor, we have elders, and we have deacons. Now, I'm not saying that's bad. But I'm saying when it becomes nothing more than a good system of checks and balances like our government has, it's not a godly model. Now, again, I didn't say it's not godly to have deacons. I certainly don't think it's ungodly to have elders or pastors. But I've seen churches where basically the elders felt their job was to make sure the preacher does his. I've seen churches where you had elders and deacons meeting together with equal vote. And so you could technically have the elders make a decision based on their spiritual leadership to go a certain way. And the deacons literally outvote them. In my first church, who I love those people, when I started there running about 50 or 60. <laughs> it was a small church. We grew to about 200. Seven miles outside of Mount Sterling. One of the problems with growing like that is we got to the point we needed to have more people serve communion. Now, any of you that have been in a Christian church a long time will recognize this setup. Remember the days when only elders could pray for communion? And only deacons could pass out communion? So we had a problem. I think we had four deacons and about three or four elders. And we needed to have more communion trays passed out. And I said, hey, we, know we just need to get a couple more votes. No, no. The answer was we need more deacons so that we could pass out communion trays. Okay? That's not good. I mean, it's not bad to have deacons serving communion trays. But it's bad when your decision to get more deacons is so that you can just do that. I'm glad we're way past that. Okay. Now, so what do we need to do? There's some questions we have to ask. Again, are we going to call Bible things by Bible names? Do we nominate and vote deacons into office or do we appoint them to specific ministry needs? When I started five years ago, Sam Bologna was actually a deacon back then. Uh, I think Michael Jackson was a deacon. I think Jeff McClure was a deacon. Uh, I think Rick Harris was still a deacon. We had five or six. And I can remember uh, they were meeting once a month, and they would pray together, which was great, and they'd have a little devotional, which was great, and then they would spend some time just discussing, well, what needs to be done around here? What, what can we do? Now, to my knowledge, not a single one of them, and Sam, correct me if I'm wrong on this, not a single one of them had a specific task, did they? So you have a bunch of guys meeting, scratching their heads, saying, what are we going to do this month? Okay, that was the system. Okay, and we're going to dig a little bit deeper next week on how the apostles did this and why they did this. Now, if you look in the book of Acts, there's a situation where you've got these Grecian widows who they were needing to be fed, 
that the number was growing because of the persecution and the apostles were kind of handling that and they said, hey, it wouldn't be right for us to leave the ministry of prayer and the word to wait on tables. And so they appointed a certain number of people to do it. Now, many of you might have a Bible that says in your notes, which is not in the original version, but it might say the first deacons. Okay, there's some question whether or not they were ever called deacons. They're not called deacons in that context. They are called servants. Okay, interestingly though, it's not the word diaconus that's used. And so, but bottom line is you had this situation where there's a need and the apostles appoint these people to meet that need. Now, later on, again, we're going to spend more time on this next week. Later on, you see one of them named Philip. You know, he's not waiting on tables now. He's on the road south going towards Gaza and he meets this dude that's an Ethiopian eunuch and he, you know, tells him about Jesus and he winds up baptizing the guy. Then you got this other guy who was picked to wait on tables, whether it was actually a deacon or not, we don't know. But then all of a sudden you see him preaching about Jesus. The Jews don't like it. They're ready to stone him and they literally stone him and he's the first martyr. So evidently, whatever he did in that whole business of waiting on tables, that wasn't all they did. Okay. And again, we're going to talk about that a little bit more next week. So the question, do the deacons have a specific term? Or do they serve until the task is completed? Again, five years ago, the deacons that we had in our church had a, just like our elders, you'd serve for one year, you get elected, you serve for one year. If you got renominated, you serve for two more. You can only serve three total, and then you had to step off. Now, what if Linda Moore had been a deacon under that policy? Every three years, someone else would have to take the helm of Golden Age. Now, Don Schaefer, this is your second year doing this, isn't it? Third? You ain't going nowhere, by the way. Anybody vote to let Don get off the board for, you know, get off that role for a year? I don't think so, Tim. <laughs> it can happen. Uh, Will, this is his first year. We're going to make sure he does at least three more because he's doing such a wonderful job. Thank you. But the structure, again, our structure was set up that you could only serve in that leadership role for three years. And then you had to take a year off. Okay. Third question. Do the deacons spend more time in meetings or in meeting needs? Fourth question. Are the deacons known more for their titles than their service? Again, not critical of the men that were serving as deacons. But if you ask them what do we do? Well, I'm a deacon. Okay, what are you doing? Uh, I don't have a role. Okay, so that, that's an issue. Now, there's a fellow named Jim Dow, Dalrymple. Okay, don't ask. I, I got it written down here. Don't ask me to pronounce it again because probably won't, I, I may not have got it right then. Jim <laughs> wrote in the Christian Standard, and if you're from the Christian Church, you're familiar with the Christian Standard. It is a very conservative Christian Church publication. So this isn't someone from a different denomination. And he wrote this in the Christian Standard. He said, we have recreated deacons in our cultural image. We have flipped what was meant to be an embodiment of Jesus' servant ministry and made it an embodiment of our own power structures. Let me be clear. To be a deacon is not to have an honorific title, but to have a humble task. Deacons are not appointed to meet in a committee, but to meet needs in the community. Deacons lead the way in Christ-like service. It is time for deacons to trade their, trade their ballots and boardrooms for the basin and the towel. Now, let me be clear. We never had any problems with our deacons. There's not some reason for us to talk about this because, you I mean, we had a bunch of bad eggs as deacons. No, that's not it at all. I don't want you to think that. So let me ask you a question, and I don't want to know how you voted. If you noticed on Tuesday, we had two amendments. I'm pretty sure most of you understood because it was covered on TV. We covered it here. Most of you probably understood exactly what Amendment 2 was. Yes or no, the wording on, the, on abortion issues in the Constitution. How many of you are really honest that, you know what, I saw that Amendment 1, I'd never seen it before. I was curious what it's about. I don't want to have you. Did anybody say, man, what the heck was that? Okay, there's, yeah, several of you. Okay. 
I really figure that, and I'm not, this is not a place for commentary on whether or not that should have passed or not, okay? Uh, uh, but the bottom line is, you and I, and the only reason I know what it was about is because I called somebody who's in state government and got them to explain it to me, okay? So you're not dumb or, you know, alone in this. But the bottom line is, every couple of years, we'll see something like this. You get, to, you get to vote, and you're thinking about, okay, who do I want for judge? Who do I want for magistrate? Who do I want for city council? Who do I want for dog catcher? And then all of a sudden, you turn that ballot over and says, there's an amendment on here. I've never heard of this. What's this nonsense? And the way they word, especially the first one, you had to be a Tennessee lawyer to understand what they meant, right? In a couple weeks, matter of fact, December 11th, more than a couple weeks, we're going to have our annual congregational meeting to approve. We're going to have two new elders' names on there, okay? It's not a secret. Okay, I'll tell you right now. One of them is Chris Martin, and the other one is Jeremy Barnett. Okay, a couple of our elders right now are, are planning to rotate off, and two of them that are on there now are still on, and they're not, they're not up for rotation yet. And uh, the reason two of them are stepping off is so that even though all of them don't need to, we didn't want to have four seasoned elders off at the same time with somebody new. Okay, so they're, they're doing the right thing. So that's going to be part of the election. You'll, you, will present, you will be presented with a ballot for the budget. That will be explained. You'll see a copy of it. And all these things, you'll have ample time to ask an elder or, or Don Schaefer about the finances. What's this? Any explanation? We want to give you that. Okay, it's plenty forewarning on this. Okay, there's also going to be an amendment request to change the bylaws when it comes to the idea and wording of deacon. Okay, now... You, you, you might say, why are we doing this? Well, a couple reasons. Number one, we've had several people in the congregation ask, why don't we have deacons? The bylaws say a certain thing. Honestly, we're not doing it that way. So we either need to start doing it that way or change the way we do it. And the present elders, as well as some of the past elders, specifically the last two groups of elders, the last couple of years, have suggested a change. Okay, my job is to try to explain why we would do that. And I'm 100% for it. So, what do our bylaws say right now? Most of you probably don't know. Okay, that's not a secret. If you want a copy of the bylaws, we will gladly get you a copy. It's wonderful reading. Uh, article 4, I'm sorry, actual, Article 6 details the office of deacon. Listen to this. A deacon will oversee, coordinate the activities of a particular ministry or ministry team to maximize the mission objectives of that particular ministry. Any candidate for deacon must meet the scriptural qualifications. We read those earlier, 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 12. Be nominated by an active member of Bedford Acres Christian Church by the method determined by the board of elders, approved and submitted by the board of elders to the congregation for affirmation at a congregational meeting. Deacons shall be affirmed at a congregational meeting and must receive 75% of the casted votes. Any box that is not checked is not counted for or against. All voting shall be by secret ballot of the members of the church who are present at the congregational meeting. No church member present will be refused a ballot, but no ballots will be distributed or, and collected prior to the official. So no mail-in absentee voting, okay? And no absentee ballots will be accepted. Deacon terms would be no longer than three years. The first term would be one year. The second would be two. And any term after that would be three. Uh, but there must be a one-year break after every three years. An ordination service will blah, blah, blah. Here's what it says right next, right underneath this ministry team leaders. Okay, could call them servant leaders. The ministry team leader will oversee, coordinate the activities of the team to maximize the mission objective of that particular ministry. Now, let me read the first phrase from the deacon again. A deacon will oversee, coordinate the activities of a particular ministry ministry team to maximize the mission objectives of the particular ministry. It is verbatim. And this is, this is the way it's been. It's been this way for years. So you've got deacons that are told to do this certain thing, and you've got ministry team leaders told to do the exact same thing. So now what's different is the ministry team leader will be appointed by the board of elders, and for the first time appointment of a ministry team leader, the team will be for one year. Subsequent terms will be for three. Now, it doesn't say it, but some could argue that even ministry team leaders might ought to have to stay off a year. It's not phrased that way, so there's that loophole. So why would we want to change this? 
Number one, first, the view of our present and recent past elders feel it is not as close to the biblical model as it should be, and in reality, it's impractical. Second, the work needs to be done, the work that needs to be done by deacons is the same work already being done by ministry team leaders and servant leaders now. Third, if the word diakonos means servant, then why not use that term? Again, we want to call Bible things by Bible names. So what we're asking, and we're going to ask, and again, next week we're going to dig a lot more into what about deaconesses and, and what about an Acts where it talks about servant leaders. Uh, what would the new wording look like? So I just read you the existing wording in our bylaws. The section about deacons, as it stood, that big long section would be omitted entirely. In its place, it would say servant leaders, and in brackets, ministry team leaders. Servant leaders will oversee, coordinate the activities of a particular ministry uh, uh, or ministry team to maximize the mission objectives of that particular ministry. Didn't change a thing. Okay. Second, any candidate for servant leader must meet the scriptural qualifications or characteristics of 1 Timothy 3 and be approved by the elders. The servant leader will have both the budget and the authority necessary to accomplish the task. This position is open by established New Testament precedent to either male or female, Romans 6, 1 and 2. And then the word diakonos, or the term diakonos, is translated deacon, deaconess, deacons only five times in the New Testament, but the word servant is the literal translation and the most often used in the New Testament. So we're going to ask you to approve this change in the bylaws. That's what it's going to mean. And it needs to be approved, I think, I think it's 75%. Uh, but... Uh, that's what that's about. So, we're asking for a change. This will be voted on as part of the congregational meeting on December 11th, along with the other things. And we're going to visit this next week again a little bit with who is to select and how should they function. Right now, what the reason, I'll tell you exactly how a will was selected. You know, uh, Rick Harris had done it for a while and was doing a great job. Uh, he needed a break, was still willing to help. And we tapped Will because Will has administrative experience. He's good with uh, recruiting people, you know. And I don't want to embarrass Rick in, Rick in any way, shape, form, but Rick would flat tell you that recruiting people was not his strong suit. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a worker bee. Will, you know, he, he's run businesses. He's good about, you know, coordinating other people, and he was willing to do it. So we, we didn't go through you all to ask if it's okay. The elders approved asking him to lead this ministry. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, the others would have had the same uh, same process. So we're asking for that. Does that make sense? Okay. If it doesn't come back, well, if it, even if it does come back next week. So now how do you turn this into an invitation? <laughs> That's a challenge, all right? You know, let's, let's be honest. Bottom line is we've been talking about what is a servant. You know, maybe God is calling you to be a servant. You know, maybe, maybe he's calling you to have a relationship with the greatest servant we've ever seen. Because Jesus Christ is a servant. He came to, he, he came to serve. And, and as we follow him, we're called to serve. So as the team comes, I'm going to lead us in prayer. And, and maybe you've been thinking about making this your church home. Maybe you've been thinking about serving. Maybe you're thinking right now, maybe I need to go put my name on that list to make mashed potatoes. Serve that way. That'd be great. Maybe you've got a prayer concern. I know, you know, we've got some folks that have just recently had loss in their family. I know Ronnie's mom passed away. I, I see, you know, we had a funeral this week. Uh, you know, there's others that are, you know, having a tough time. Maybe you just need to come and pray. Make this your church home. Be baptized in a brand new baptistry. We'd love to, to see you do that. But let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for calling us to, to join you as the ultimate servant. Help us, Lord, uh, when it comes to this role of deacon or servant leader or ministry team leader. Help us to get it right. You know, we, we want to we do it right. We, you know, you are not the author of confusion, but of order. Help us to, uh, you know, to serve in, in orderly and in ways that bless others and honor you. Bless now, Lord, this time of commitment. And if there's even one who needs to respond to you, we ask that they would in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me?
Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride. so much for coming. Don't forget, a lot of stuff going on in the next few weeks. Uh, think about who you can bring. Think about who you can encourage. Think about how God may want you to serve. Don't forget to sign ups out there. Uh, give somebody a hug and God bless. <laughs>